Welcome back to our study in the book of Romans. This is the Romans Education, part 7, and this is session 48. There is... Uh, maybe I should do this at the end. I don't know. Maybe I should do this at the start. You realize, okay, we're in the, we're in the midst of this Ezekiel passage, and we're going to pick that up, and I do want to talk about that. I don't want you to lose track of that. But you understand all... In fact, let me just look ahead and see if there's a way to kind of segue into this for where we're going. Um, <sighs> I just can't make it easy for myself. All right. Maybe I'll do that when I can segue that better. I think that's a better way to do that. Okay. I'm sorry. I was thinking about something. Something that is important. It's in my mind. I want us to talk about it because I want us to be able to uh, understand issues. And every once in a while, in order to explain that, I do what people refer to as a rabbit trail. But sometimes it's those extra details that allow us to really understand and get a bearing for that. Um, for instance, uh, I got an email from a man who said, um, I've been looking at your, um, your stuff on the website, and he said, I've really enjoyed it. He said, but I noticed that in some of those studies, when you talked about the tribulation, you, uh, you referred to it as the tribulation and you referred to it as the day of the Lord's wrath as though that were, those were interchangeable. And he said, I don't see them as the same thing. He said, I see the wrath not starting until the midpoint of the tribulation and he said, because that's when we get raptured. Now, I think I know where he was coming from on that. Um, there was a book that was written quite a number of years ago by a man who I think was honestly trying to come to grips with the idea of rapture. People talk about, you know, are you a pre-trib a mid-trib, which is what that is, a post-trib, or in, you know, or, or do you not see a rapture? You know, you're all, you know. So anyway, and that's the way we always looked at it. You know, we were kind of having a discussion about this last night at the house. But look, look let, me, let me talk about this just for a second because in this phrase, uh, let's put it like this. When he said that to me, in his email, he said, you know, I'd like some clarification about that. And, 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 he, and he actually went to a scripture, I want to, is either in Revelation or Matthew, to talk about this rapture at the middle of the tribulation. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you, that the rapture of the body of Christ is not in Matthew or Revelation. Those of you that understand right division know that. But there is something else here, and I want to make sure this is in our minds, and we are going to come back to this. We have to. But look, when you think about this timeline of the way things are, when you see that verse, the night is far spent, the day is at hand, what comes into your mind? What do you think now that we've been through it? What do you think when you see that? The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Okay. Okay. All right. And um, so you've talked about that far spent condition. And that, that is the condition things were at the end of the extension of mercy. When we say Satan's night is far spent, 
We're saying that what it was designed to ultimately produce is now almost accomplished, ready to be accomplished. It's far spent in that almost everything it needed to do to get there has now been done. And we realize that God interrupted not only His program with Israel, but He also was able to interrupt Satan's next step in his night, which would be to do what? Bring his Antichrist onto the world scene. And God did that not by telling Satan, no, I'm not going to let you, because he is going to allow him to do it. But what he did is he purchased the right to do something with the standing of the world that made it so that Satan was not able to bring the culmination of what his knight was trying to produce to that place. He couldn't accomplish that. So what I'm trying to get you to see is this, that as long as the world is in a position of being reconciled, Satan's works of darkness, do they continue? Yes. The darkness of his night, still there? Yes. But that last step of bringing in that man of sin has been put on hold for him until God is through reconciling the world unto himself. And when that is finished, in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. The blessed hope we commonly refer to as the rapture. And once that world no longer is in the position of being reconciled, what status will it be in? Uh, okay, well, the, it, it, the day is at hand when that's, that's true, but what's the status of the world? How would... what? Say it's Satan's possession. What did you say? If what? Go back, back to enemy. Okay, all of those are right. I was just hoping you would use this one particular phrase. It will once again be the world of the ungodly. Did you say that, Bertha? See, I said your name on the tape, so everybody knows you got that right. And if the okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, see, I kn no, you're not. No, you're not. Okay. <laughs> I love it. Okay. No, no, okay. But uh, I just didn't hear you. That was all. Uh, so it goes right back to where it was at the end of the extension of mercy when both the Gentiles and Israel had said to God and His Christ, let us break their bands asunder and cast their cords from us. We don't want God, Right? It's going to go right back. And, it, and when the world is in that status, now Satan can bring in the remaining portion of his night and then the Lord's day, which was at hand, will then burst upon the scene with great wrath. Alright? So as long as this reconciling of the world is happening... By the way, you say, well, how do you know that? Well, look, I'm going to say it to you this way. If he had earned the right to do that by the total repudiation of all three members of the Godhead back at the time of Acts, uh, at the stoning of Stephen, then why didn't he bring his man of sin in? I mean, if that's what he was wanting to do. What, what more was there yet? Because, by the way, Psalm 2 tells you the criteria for that. Let's cast God off. They did that back there. What's He waiting for? Don't kid me. Because the status of the world has now changed before Satan earned the right to bring his man into the world... God in His Son earned the right to deal with the world in the status of being reconciled to Him. First things first. So here's what I'm going to tell you. The tribulation or Daniel's 70th week cannot 
take place until the world is no longer being reconciled to God. The man of sin cannot come on the scene until the world is no longer in the status of being reconciled to God. The Antichrist can't make a seven-year covenant unless he's here before the start of the seven years. True? And if he, has, if he can't come in while the world's being reconciled, then you have to say to yourself, then isn't this true? I have to calm down because my voice is going away. This can't start till the reconciling is over. So how in the world can you put the event that marks the end of the reconciling in the middle of a time period that can't start until the other one ends? Are, are you with me there? This is not about I'm pre-trib, I'm mid-trib, I'm post-trib. That's the way you look at it when you don't understand what's really happening in the timeline. And then, you know, we talked about this too. Everybody runs to the Bible to find verses to back up their particular stand or position. That's not how you do this. Paul told you exactly what, remember what that verse is about? That's about the timing of this dispensation of grace. When God brought this thing in, Satan's night was far spent. When it's over, the day won't be here, but it will be at hand. The only thing separating the day from the end of the dispensation of grace is the completing of the night. Because when, that, when this came in, it was only far spent, not completely spent. So you still have the remaining portion of that, which means when this ends, the day is at hand. Because what do you have? The remaining small portion of Satan's night. And if, and if this is the thing that sits between these two, then you can't, you can't have this until that is over. So no matter where you live in the dispensation of grace, you're living in Paul's day, the night is far spent, and when that dispensation of grace is over, the day will be at hand. And that's just as true for us today, 2,000 years later. See, it doesn't matter, because when you understand what that verse is really saying, you know it doesn't matter where in the dispensation of grace you live. That's a true statement. Because this isn't really describing the dispensation of grace itself. It's describing the timing that sits on both sides of it. So if you can't complete this until this is done, tell me how the end of this can happen in the middle of that which cannot begin until it ends. Are you with me there? I just want to, I just want people to go, but, but I just think it happens in the middle, and I'm going to go, duh, duh, duh. because if, if, it, if, the, if the necessary thing to get this started is that this has to end, this ends with this, this marks the end. And if this can't begin until this takes place, then it's impossible for this to take place in the middle of that which cannot yet begin. All right, now that seems simple to me. And so it's not a matter of me going and finding a bunch of verses and trying to say that, you know, uh, well, we're, we're not appointed under wrath. And someone else says, yeah, well, the wrath doesn't start until the midway point of the tribulation. So we could rapture out at the midway point. You don't understand Romans 13, 12. The point is not about all of that. The point is about the timing of the dispensation of grace that put all the rest of that on hold. All right, now you just nod your heads because you know I'm on my soapbox. And you want me to... Okay, at least Sarita's honest. 
Could the, Mark, could you zero in on your wife down here on the camera? I want everybody to see Serena. Okay. Do, do you get this? So see, it's not, gosh, I'm not a theologian. I don't know where to go get all those verses about the rapture is going to happen before. You don't need all those verses. You need one verse. And you know what? And when you read that, look, at it. I will tell you how this debate will go. When someone says, like this gentleman, who means well, he says, you know what? See, he says the wrath doesn't start till the middle, so the rapture doesn't happen to happen until the middle. And I'm going, yeah, but the rapture, which is the end of the reconciling of the world, can't take place. I mean, that, that is the end of the reconciling of the world, and if this can't start till that's over, then you can't postpone that to the middle because there would be no middle. Okay, I'm just... So I'm, I'm just... Okay, look. I'm going to be done with it and then we're going to move on and I'm going to feel like I didn't make it clear enough. But I want you to... I just want you to see that verse solves that issue for you. It's not a matter of when the wrath starts. That's my point. It doesn't matter. The Antichrist can't be revealed. Israel's program can't resume. And the remaining portion of Satan's night, none of that can happen until the blessed hope. Until the body is removed. Because only then does the, does the, is the world no longer in the position of being reconciled. Then it goes right back to where it was. Satan takes right back up in the world of the ungodly. And God brings in the day of his wrath. And if you want to debate about when the, the, the wrath actually starts, knock yourself out. Because none of that can get cranked up till we're gone. That's what that's about. And you know what? You know, and you know what, in the old, not that long ago, I would have said, I sure wish Paul would have made that clearer. But you know what? There it is, and really, once you know what it is, it's pretty clear. I, I see it. Now, maybe I'm the only one. Okay. But I just look at that. I just want to clear that up because as people are going through this, Sometimes I think it is necessary. I haven't talked to you about that before. And I wanted to mention that because sometimes as people are going through this, they have all of these erroneous ideas that keep creeping back in to their theology. And just because we haven't dealt with it yet, they want to integrate that back in. You know what? People will do anything to move you right back into Israel's program. That's part of the policy of evil. Do not succumb to that. Okay. Unless you're planning on quitting. Cast off that work of darkness. All right. Okay. So, Ezekiel. Now that I got that out of my system. Okay. Ezekiel 16. Why are you giving me that look, Sarita? You've known me my whole life. This is what I do, right? <laughs> She's shaking her head like, there he goes again. You know, that's what happens when they know you. Look, you know what? Here's how bad we're. her and Mark used to meet with me every week. We used to meet during the week on a, I remember, was it a Tuesday? Tuesday nights, every Tuesday. And there was another couple we met together and we were just going through the Bible together. We sat in there for a couple of hours every Tuesday night. She was a glutton for punishment. And then she got away and got to Nebraska and moved back. Oh my goodness. Okay, so see, that's her fault, right? Okay. All right. Of which I'm awfully glad, by the way. Ezekiel, God is doing things to Jerusalem to stop her abominations. And he's been describing just how bad those are. And he's talked about what's going to be happening when the Babylonians come in. Here's what's going to happen to all you people in Jerusalem. You think, you think in your prideful thinking, nothing's going to happen. And I'm telling you, this is what's going to happen. Now we'll pick it up in verse 42. Because there's the end of that. I'm sorry, 41. Oh, we did 41. Verse 42. So will I make my fury toward thee to rest, and my jealousy shall depart from thee, and I will be quiet 
and will be no more angry. In other words, God's saying, you've done all this, you've done all this, you've done all this, and the only way for me to satisfy my anger and fury towards you is to do exactly what I've told you this fifth course of punishment is going to do to you. And he says, and then, you know what? I can be satisfied because I've done something about it. And that's what he's talking about there. And so now, and by the way, those are, I, this is another way of saying, these are not idle threats. This is a reality. Now verse 43. Because thou hast not remembered the days of thy youth, but hast fretted me in all these things, behold, therefore I also will recompense thy way upon thine head, saith the Lord God, and thou shalt not commit, th commit this lewdness above all thine abominations. And he's talking about the special way in which Israel, and especially the southern kingdom, like the northern kingdom did, has corrupted herself with this lewdness. And he's going to do this by punishing them in the fifth course of punishment. Now, I told you all the things I told you last time to get us to this point. Remember I told you about Sodom and how in Sodom he concentrated these various categories of his works of darkness to see if he could produce the world of the ungodly again in a, in a, in a small form. He was very successful with that. God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And so now he is working at that again. Now, now the reason I bring that up is because he is about to say something about Jerusalem in reference to Sodom. If God did that to Sodom, now I want us to pick up the reading in, in Ezekiel chapter 16, and I want to show you just how evil Jerusalem has become. Verse 44, Behold, everyone that useth proverbs shall use this proverb against thee, saying, still talking to Jerusalem, As is the mother, so is her daughter. Thou art thy mother's daughter, that loatheth her husband and her children. And thou art the sister of thy sisters, which loathe their husbands and their children. Your mother was a Hittite, and your father was an Amorite. So he goes back to that again. Let's keep reading it. And thine elder sister is Samaria. What, what is Samaria? You're talking about cities here. So... Okay, she's saying Gentiles. But what, what, other, what significance did Samaria have in Israel? No, no, not, no. Samaria, well, I, I'm just going to draw the map, but I'll just tell you. Samaria was the, the counterfeit capital of the northern kingdom. Jerusalem was the capital in the southern kingdom. Now, I'm going to show you something about Samaria, but first, let's go ahead and, and read this. Thine elder sister is Samaria, she and her daughters that dwell at thy left hand. And thy younger sister that dwelleth on thy right hand is Sodom and her daughters. Now, you know who Sodom is. And he's saying, you know the wickedness of Sodom and what these things produced in Sodom. Those things produced something in Samaria, too. Which, by the way, is why the northern kingdom went away into captivity first because of that. So he says, you're just like your sisters. And your, this sister is Samaria and this sister is Sodom. Now we'll keep reading. Verse 47. Yet hast thou not walked after their ways, nor done after their abominations, but as if that were a very little thing, Thou wast corrupted more than they in all thy ways. He said, oh, you didn't do what Samaria and Sodom did. You did more. He said, you looked at what they did like it was something very little. Like it was nothing. And what did God do to Sodom? What did God do to Samaria? And so... Verse 48, As I live, saith the Lord God, Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, thou and thy daughters. Now that's quite a statement, isn't it? 
knowing how God felt about Sodom. Now he's going to continue this in verse 49. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride. Can you... I mean, that's not hard to locate where that thing is. Fullness of bread. Abundance of idleness. Right here on those. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. And they were haughty. And we can go right back to pride. And committed abomination right here before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. You know what? We have all three categories of the works of darkness listed in that passage. And he says, and for that reason, he said, I took them away. <coughs> that was also true, not just in Sodom. Which, by the way, Sodom was a city down in the southern kingdom. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom. But now, here's what I, I want to uh, 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 talk about this Sodom and Gomorrah just for a moment. Because... The abominations that were committed in Samaria and in Sodom were committed with the full knowledge that they were in opposition to God and in cooperation with the adversary. Israel was not a people that was not warned about the adversary. They were warned. And when they did what they did, they did it with that knowledge in mind. And so, because they willingly participated in all three categories of those works of darkness because they love the darkness rather than the light, then God is going to bring this fifth course of punishment upon them and punish them for their wickedness. Jerusalem is not playing the harlot against her will. She's doing it willingly and freely. So now, verse 51 is going to pick this up and show her corruption under the microscope. Neither has Samaria committed half of thy sins. Hold it. Samaria got carried away captive and got destroyed and ransacked. And he says, she didn't commit half of your sins, Jerusalem. But thou hast multiplied thine abominations more than they. Who's the they? Samaria and Sodom. And has justified, this is an incredible statement, and has justified thy sisters in all thine abominations which thou hast done. He said, you know what? You're so bad. You, by comparison, you justified what Sodom and Samaria did. You made them look like they didn't do anything. That's how bad you are. <coughs> That's quite a, <coughs> quite a statement. Verse 52, Thou also which hast judged thy sisters, bear thine own shame for thy sins which thou hast committed more abominable than they. They are more righteous than thou. Yea, be thou confounded also and bear thy shame in, thou, in that thou hast justified thy sisters. And now verse 58, Thou hast borne thy lewdness and thine abominations, saith the Lord. For thus saith the Lord God, I will even deal with thee as thou hast done, which hast despised the oath in breaking the covenant. So he's talking about their lewdness, their abominations, more abominable in the verse before that. I'm pointing all of that out because as you look at those in your notes, you ought to be looking at where those things go in those categories of uh, works of darkness and be able to identify them accordingly and see that they were all at work in them. Everything in the list ought to be disgusting to us as it is to our Heavenly Father. But now there's one last thing that I want to turn our attention to. And that is the tactics or the strategy, as I said in that first slide in, in this session, the strategy behind these works of darkness. I, I don't think I put this in your notes, but I did put it on the PowerPoint in 1943, during World War II, there was a strategy that the Allied forces put together against Germany. They determined that one of the ways to shut down the German war machine 
was to bomb all of the ball bearing plants in Germany because every vehicle utilized ball bearings for movement and if they could shut down if they could bomb the ball bearings plants they thought that would do it now I'm going to show you a picture of one of those plants these are actually pictures that were taken back as they were devising this military strategy so the United States 8th Air Force planned daytime precision strikes against seven ball bearings plants that were in and around Germany. This was amazing. As I show you this next one, there's a picture of the bombs that were being dropped. Actually, England dropped night bombing, but it was a very broad carpet bombing type deal where they were just trying to bomb everything and hit something. We were going at a, in the daytime, but you understand the daytime is more dangerous. You had to contend with fighters in the daytime. And so, and by the way, we suffered some pretty heavy losses because at that time, that early in the campaign for us, we didn't have any long-range fighters that could escort our bombers all the way to Germany and back. So you know what they depended on? They'd all get bunched up together and just try to, you know, fend off any fighters on their own. We lost a lot of planes during that time until we finally got our fighters over there that could actually escort these bombing runs. But it was an amazing thing because a total on Schweinfurt, that first plant that you saw, we bombed, we, we dropped 7,933 bombs. I'm sorry, bombing runs were made and a total number of bombs of 592,598 individual bombs dropped on those ball bearings plants. This is a picture of what it looked like below as those bombs were hitting their targets. And what I thought was really interesting is I found this map when they were devising the strategy where they marked out where all the ball bearings plants were and guys had to get familiar with how that map looked so that when they were flying over they'd be able to recognize you can see a river running through there you'd recognize those things and drop those bombs and and, and try to put those those ball bearings plants out of commission so why am I showing you this because that was a strategy to shut down the German war machine. That was one strategy. It wasn't the only one, but it was one of the strategies. And by the way, when you drop a half a million bombs on them, you have invested something in that strategy. So in other words, they're not just bombing stuff for the sake of bombing. They were locating what they thought were points that would have the maximum impact on Germany's ability to conduct war. The adversary by these works of darkness is doing the exact same thing and if I had been smart enough to figure out how to do this in the time that I had to do it I wanted to put together a battle map that Satan was using because there are areas on his map that each one of those categories are targeting. And they're not just bombing us for the sake of bombing us. It is for maximum effect to shut down any resistance. It's the same kind of thing. And so this is as good a time as any for me to take a moment and talk about Satan's war effort. You already know what his goal was. According to Isaiah, he says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast set in thine heart. And here's the five steps. Number one, I will ascend into heaven. Two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Three, I will sit also upon the side of the congregation in the sides of the north. 
Uh, four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And five, I will be like the Most High. That final one is the final goal. I'll be like the Most High. And let me talk to you about that in a way I have not talked to you about that before. If the goal is for Him to be like the Most High, He does not mean that He can, He thinks He can destroy God. He does not mean that he thinks he can do away with him. But what he wants to do, and by the way, just because he usurped the possession of heaven and earth, doesn't mean he gets God's thrones. Turn over to Revelation 5, and when you see John talking about the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, he says, And I saw him that sat on the throne and had a seven-sealed book in his hand. That's not the adversary. He doesn't get to sit on God's throne. So what he wants to do is he wants to set up three similar counterfeit thrones from which he will rule over the area that he has taken possession of. And what Satan would really like to do is have God say, okay, look, you've got this stuff, you rule over your part, and I'll rule over my part. But you and I know God is not going to say that. He is either going to have it all or He's going to have none. And He is not going to compromise with the adversary. Now Satan, that's why it said, I'll be like the Most High. Hey, if he had his own little thing going. And by the way, that is part of the answer to why does Satan continue to do this when he knows he's going to lose. Look, he's not after destroying God. He's just after holding on to this peace to be like the Most High. God's got His part over there. I've got my part over here. I'm just trying to hang on to my part. And He would be happy with that. But God is not going to allow that to happen. But So my point here is that he is going to erect his own thrones to be able to do that. He has done this before, erected a counterfeit, and let me show it to you. When, when, when David and Solomon, when those two guys got through with the 80 years of reign between the two of them, 40 years of peace, the next course of punishment came in, the second course of punishment, and here's part of what that was. God said that he was going to divide their power in half. And you know what that was? That was the division of the kingdom. Now you had a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. But here was the problem. You had two kings in charge of that. Jeroboam and Rehoboam. I used to hear that. I had a professor said something real funny one time. He was talking about praying and he says, O oh, great God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and all them other born boys. And he was going on. I just had to laugh when he did that. I, it's always in my head. It's been from college days. It's stuck in my head. I think of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and Oboam. So anyway, those guys are the kings of those two, the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. And, but here's the problem. If you're the king of the northern kingdom, you have seven things called feast days that Israel is supposed to observe. And for three of those feast days, everybody is supposed to go somewhere very specific to celebrate that feast day. Where is it? In Jerusalem. And if you're in the northern kingdom, Jerusalem's the capital of the southern kingdom, that king did not want those people going back to the southern kingdom and getting in their mind, why in the world did we divide this thing up? Let's just all get back under the rule of Jerusalem. He didn't want that. So we're about to read what he did to stop that from happening. He did the same thing that we just read that Satan wants to do when he wants to be like the Most High. He's going to set up counterfeit thrones over a counterfeit kingdom and he's going to try to hold on to that. That's what was happening in the northern kingdom of Israel. 1 Kings 12, 26. And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. He says, Oh, brother, I can see this unraveling on me now. Verse 27. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again to their Lord. Even unto... By the way, I thought it was really interesting. Lowercase l... 
It's not talking about God. It's talking about the other king. <coughs> Turn again unto the Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Does that sound familiar? And said unto them, by the way, do you think he's thinking about that golden calf back there? I'm going to say he is. Do you know why? Because when Moses was up on Mount Sinai getting those, those tables of stone, those people took all the gold and brought it, remember, to Aaron, and they made that golden calf. And do you remember what was said to, to them? They said, as for this Moses, we want not what has happened to him, so we need gods to follow. So they made this golden calf. And you remember what they said? Here's your God that brought you out of Egypt. Do you remember that? Here's the God that brought you out of Egypt. I thought it was funny, though, when Moses came down and he says, what is going on here? He says, well, the people brought their gold and we put it in the deal and this calf sprang out. <laughs> if I'm Moses, my next question, do, you, do I look like an idiot? The calf sprang out. No wonder there was a slaughter in the camp that day. But look what he says. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. He knew exactly what that was. He was repeating something they all knew about. You know what he's doing? He's reinstituting the worship of Baal. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. Dan is the northernmost tribe, by the way, in Israel. It's the far north. And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests. He made a house of high places. That's altars to false gods. And he made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. We're going to have our own priesthood. We're going to have our own gods. We have our own altars. And guess what? We're not just putting it in one place. We're putting it in two places. Look how forward thinking we are. Jerusalem stuck that old fashioned religion one place. I'm making this convenient for you people. We got a calf up there in Dan, and we got one there at Bethel. We're going to let you have a choice. We, we're the party of choice. <laughs> Whatever. And Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. Oh, like unto the feast that is in Judah. Do you see what he's doing? And it says, <clears throat> And he offered upon the altar... So did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, because there were no Jewish feast days on that month, on that day. He devised this one on his own. This is his counterfeit here even in the month which he had devised of his own heart and ordained a feast unto the children of Israel and he offered upon the altar and burned incense. And the point that I'm after in all that is this. That he had... Did I already turn that off? Seriously? Five minutes ago? I have way too much fun up here. I seriously do not remember turning that off. Okay. Okay, so here's, okay, all right. Oh, yeah, I love to talk about the devil. <laughs> yeah, Want to see pictures? Okay, I mean, come on. It's a joke. It's a joke. I'll get an email now for sure, right? Okay, look. This counterfeit system that was set up up there, you know what he could have said? We want to be like the sacrificial system in Jerusalem. 
Just like Satan was saying, I want to be like the Most High. And so, in order to do what he wants to do, for Satan to be like the Most High, don't forget this little battle map thing I was talking about. He has devised three categories of weapons that are all three pointed at... You know, this group is pointed at ball bearings plants. That group is going to be pointed at munitions plants places and that group is going to be pointed at another strategic target and here's what Satan knows there is three pillars that are holding everything up as far as God is concerned and those three pillars are the targets for the three categories of Satan's works of darkness. And when we, not next week because we're off next week, but when we come back, we will move immediately to what each one of these categories are trying to take out. Where are they on the map? What is it they're taking out? And now your eyes are going to be open to something magnificently wise. Your heavenly Father, when He took them into that fifth course of punishment, He knew there was, and one of these pillars was in a very overriding way, had been, well, no, before I say it that way, I have to say it like this. These categories are working not only to destroy this pillar, but to replace it with a counterfeit. There's one of these pillars that was um, so necessary for what God was going to do with even the remnant of Israel that that counterfeit had to be destroyed so the possibility of that pillar being re-erected would be there because if it didn't get done, there would be no remnant. At the end of the 70 years, there would have been no remnant. And God said, I've got to make sure that I destroy this category for sure. <coughs> and so He does. I want to, when I show you what each one of these targets, I need to come back then and show you how God says that. And He says, and here's the reason that I'm de destroying the counterfeit so that the true pillar can be re-established re because only if that thing gets established can I have a believing remnant that in the second installment will return to Jerusalem and rebuild the wall. And God is looking long term at this thing. And He realizes how overwhelming these categories are. And I want us to see them because, look, you have to understand, we are this close. This is the final thing that we will look at. Not changing my mind about that. It's not the last thing we could look at. The last thing we will look at before I then begin to instruct you on how to cast off those works of darkness. And the reason I'm doing this is because this is the final piece of the puzzle that explains to you just how dangerous these works of darkness are, how close they came. No, no, let me back up. How successful they were in getting Israel to pass the point of no return, to become Satan's loss of lawful captive, to make God give Israel a bill of divorcement that allowed the hedges to be broken down and the wall to be crumbled and for the enemy to come into Emmanuel's land and take control. They were so successful that that not only happened, but they are geared to be successful against us as well. We cannot afford to go into this fight ignorantly. Well, that's why Paul said, we are not ignorant of his devices. But you know what? I think we are. I'm just talking about Christianity in general. And so what we've got to do is, we've got to see 
just what these things do and how they do it. And then, that in turn, I believe, will create the last speck of godly hatred for Satan's works of darkness and put that full measure of enthusiasm in us to say, I want to cast those off. Because that's where we're going to go next. Okay, I'm tempted to say stuff, but I know. It's over. Okay, so let's have prayer and we'll be done. Father, we're grateful for all you have given us in Jesus Christ. You've given us a completed revelation of Scripture that tells us everything we need to know. And we have full assurance, Lord, that nothing has been overlooked or left out. Nothing will take you by surprise that you haven't taken into account and already put into your word to equip us. We realize that we have an enemy that is dedicated to, to producing the blackness of the darkness of his night and his untruths in this world. And we realize, Lord, that we are the antidote for that. And we gladly volunteer to labor with you against the adversary and his policies of evil. Thank you for the great privilege of it. But Lord, we need to be equipped and we need to have an understanding. There doesn't need to be any doubt in our mind. We need to understand what is available to us, what works and how to work it. And Lord, we are counting on your word to effectually work that in our inner man. And we look forward to it, Lord, with eagerness. And we pray these things.